I'd be lying if I didn't tell you my heart got a little proud when I saw him up there doing it. Didn't Brother Orton Orton do a good job tonight? I wondered why some of you brethren looked at him so funny when he said he'd be done that quick. Ha ha, he did it. I ain't making that promise. <laughs> First Kings, God bless you. I love you all. You're wonderful. Uh, it'll be a while before I give you my title, but I want you to help me preach tonight. I admittedly am going to preach a message that I had another preacher. I've only preached it once at my church. Had another preacher that heard it and evidently liked it and has preached it all over the United States, I guess, or all over the world. But uh, since I know where it come from and I'm uh, the originator, I think maybe I got a right to preach tonight to the precious church of God. First Kings chapter number 18, verse number 25. First Kings chapter number 18, verse number 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, watch this. I don't mean me drinking the water, I meant the scripture. Said to the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourself and dress it first. For you're many and call on the name of your gods. Put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon saying, Oh Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. (laughs) Hang on to me now. We gonna get there, you I might trust me. I don't mind pulling the wagon and I don't mind you riding the wagon, but don't drag your feet tonight. Bible said they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Woo, cry loud, for he's a God. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's in a journey or maybe the dude's asleep. (laughs) You got to wake him up. Said, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after the manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Watch. And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar that was Broken down. Are you going to help me preach tonight? Would you lift your hands up and ask God to touch us right now? God bless you. You may be seated. If you'll bear with me, I'm going to need a little runway to get this jet airplane off the ground tonight. Obviously, 
Those of you that are familiar with this story understand that it pertains to the showdown between the prophet Elijah and the prophets of an idol named Baal. We know about the challenge and we know how despite even cutting themselves, uh, scripture says their idol was incapable of answering them. We also know about how Elijah had built his altar back and then poured 12 barrels of water on the sacrifice and saw God answer with a fire so strong that it consumed the sacrifice and it consumed the altar and it even consumed the water around the altar. But for most of us, I don't need to tell you that because, well, we know the story. This is one of those stories found in the Bible that we've heard from the days of our primary Sunday school class. And yet, because of its familiarity, it would be easy for some of us to say, well, I've already heard that story a hundred times, but I find that even in my own personal study of God's Word, some of the greatest lessons that I've encountered and uncovered are those hidden lessons that sit silently in the background of some of those more obvious lessons that a passage places in our hands. I've made the statement to a lot of preachers in a lot of places that uh, no scripture can be sufficiently exhausted until you've preached it from a hundred angles and touched it from every person's perspective. Now there's a fancy term for that. It's called interpretive latitude and it means that you can take certain liberties with biblical stories by using your imagination to survey the story from every individual's perspective. For instance, we've all heard the story of the ten lepers that come to Jesus only to hear him say, if you need healed, I'll heal you. Go and show thyself to the priest. And as they walk, they all begin to notice that their leprosy had vanished. Now we could use uh, interpretive latitude tonight to talk about the obvious perspectives like the perspective of joy that those lepers found as they begin to rejoice over their cleansing. There was the perspective of unbridled gratitude of that single leper who came back to thank Jesus for what he had done. Then there is the perspective of Jesus who appreciated the fact that this one would come back to let him know he was thankful, but he was disheartened to have to ask the question, uh, where are the nine? Uh, weren't they thankful enough to come back to? But then you can utilize what isn't written in the bounds of interpretive latitude uh, to see other angles and other perspectives uh, of the same story. For instance, what about the perspective of those lepers' families? Uh, uh, those that were healed, uh, how did their families react? Were the families thankful? Did they want to find Jesus and tell them how thankful they were? What about the perspective of the high priest? Uh, I wonder what he thought when he heard this Jesus he hated so much had healed all those lepers. Uh, now, was he hesitant 
to speak ill of Jesus knowing that this man had dominion over every disease. I guess that what I'm trying to say to the church tonight is that most every story in your Bible has scores of perspectives and thus it has an endless supply of messages and lessons that can be preached from any given story. Sometimes all it takes uh, is a little reasoning to uncover those silent facts uh, that are begging you to be discovered. Uh, I don't mind telling you that it's him, that light. You're going to find the core of God's message that he has sent me to this pulpit with tonight. Again, in any given story, there are literally dozens of of lessons to be learned and facts to be revealed. In fact, the story from which our opening text is derived tonight is absolutely rich with with facts. Uh, it's rich with things that it can impart to a hungry soul's life. This is exactly why you can never pick up your Bible and write off any passage in that book because there's something there God said you don't want to change one jot or one tittle. The Bible said that the word of God uh, is good for reproof and rebuke and exhortation. Not one word of his word uh, is going to pass away. Somebody shout amen. So, uh, these priceless things sometimes are hidden in the background, just like in this story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And they're just waiting to be invested in your walk with God. Uh, tonight, if God will help me, uh, I'm going to invest one of them in you. Understand, uh, there are some obvious obvious lessons in the story obvious lesson is seen when Elijah stands up and tells the nation why be ye halt between two opinions and ushered revival into their midst. The obvious lesson is that God always honors those people that are going to step out by faith. The second lesson was simple when in the middle of a drought he called for 12 barrels of water and said I want you to pour it on the sacrifice the obvious lesson is that sacrifice will always bring the fires of God the third lesson in this story is found in seeing these prophets of this idol called Baal begin to cut themselves trying to make a blood covenant to get a response from their God. Uh, the obvious lesson here uh, is that there are some people out there whose message is wrong uh, but their heart is sincere. Can somebody shout amen tonight? Uh, but then would just a little closer look there's some other lessons that are desperately begging to be noticed in this story lessons that could have a dynamic impact on your life but first they've got to be recognized sitting silently in the background of those things that scream for our attention somebody say preach to me brother white let me tell you what I'm talking about. It would do us good to notice tonight one of those hidden lessons is that Elijah built his altar 
before his faith was put to the test. He didn't wait until all hell broke loose and said, I think I'm going to go try to build me an altar. No, no. He said, I'm going to build my altar and God's going to stand with me as I go through this thing. Ladies and gentlemen, it's seldom noticed. But if you read the story carefully, you find that before Elijah allowed the prophets of Baal to go first, he had already built the altar to the Lord there. It'd be wisdom for everybody in this sanctuary tonight to understand that somewhere before your faith is put to the test and your faith will be put to the test you better have built an altar in your world that altar's gonna be there through the storms of life and without that altar you're gonna be tossed about with every contrary wind you need an altar before your faith is put to the test But it's here, just one teeny tiny overlooked and unnoticed lesson beyond what I've told you about tonight. I've got to take you into the heart of my message. You see, there's another lesson hidden in the 27th verse that tells us that the prophets of Baal leaped upon the altar but notice with me I've always heard them preach that the prophets of Baal jumped on the altar they had built but I don't see them doing that I see them jumping on the altar of Elijah stay with me now just moments ago we established that Elijah had built his altar before the test ever started but you also might want to remember that it tells us uh, in the 30th verse how that Elijah had to repair his altar that was broken down uh, you need to realize tonight that Elijah's altar was broken down as a direct result of what happened in the 27th verse when it said that they jumped up and leaped on the altar when you look closer at what it really meant when it said that they leaped on the altar you see something completely different different. You see in the midst of trying to get their idol to move God tells us that the prophets of Baal leaped upon Elijah's altar. You've got to know this verse says more than you can see on the surface because the actual word from which they derived and translated the word leap is Pasak and Pasak means that they literally danced on the altar of Elijah I feel like preaching here let me put it in language you'll understand tonight these folks wanted a move of God and believe that with enough praise and worship their God would start moving. They were obviously sincere people desiring a spiritual breakthrough in their world and they expected the dancing and the shouting to bring that kind of a move of God but their efforts to see a spiritual move of God was futile and useless because they wanted a spiritual experience and a divine manifestation but they wanted to get it by dancing on altars they hadn't built let me preach to you today that the most important lesson that we miss in the entire story of the prophets of Baal and the prophet Elijah 
is that you can't genuinely have a move of God by dancing on somebody else's altar. If you're going to dance, you got to dance on an altar of your own. If you're going to dance, you got to build an altar of your own. So I'm in your pulpit tonight. Come here just to stir up the devil. I want you to understand. I've come to preach from this subject tonight. Don't dance on altars you didn't build. Can I proclaim to you tonight there was nothing wrong with dancing in pursuit of God. We do the same thing. I find nothing wrong with their sincerity. How many of us are sincere enough to try to cut yourself and make a blood covenant with God? I find nothing wrong with their passion. I would to God that some of us had enough passion to pursue Pursue a God we can't feel. Uh, but outside of their God being an idol, the only thing that separated them from a spiritual manifestation they wanted was that they were dancing on altars they didn't build. Uh, but God honored Elijah that day because Elijah said, I built this altar. I know this altar will stand. I took care of this altar. Ladies and gentlemen, Elijah built his altar on a relationship with God. I watched everybody getting all excited. God, I wish I was skinny. If I was skinny, I'd dance like nobody's business. I wish I was skinny tonight. But I don't suppose we got anybody in here and all the juking and jiving it was happening. I don't expect we got nobody in here worshiping Baal tonight. But that doesn't mean that my message is lost because I'm preaching to some in this building right now. You're just as sincere as those who are being blessed. You want a move of God just like those who are seeing God's hand at work in their lives. You're just as passionate about seeing a miracle that are seeing God move in their world. But God's got a message for somebody's heart heart in this house tonight you need to know the problem may not be your methods God still inhabits the praises of his people make no mistake about what I'm saying tonight we still believe in the power of dancing we still believe in the power of worship we still believe in the power of running the aisles hey hey if your praise isn't producing the power you're desiring, you need to know the problem may not be your shout. It may be that you're dancing on altars you didn't build. You're dancing on altars that you never built. You don't dance on altars you didn't build. I assure you tonight, I believe in the power of praise. In fact, I've never seen anything that worship couldn't overcome. I've seen worship lift grieving hearts at a casket. I've seen worship strengthen those broken by trials. I've seen uh, worship heal hurts that were left behind by disagreements and disappointments. I've seen uh, worship repair the shattered lives uh, of those whose failure had crushed their reputation. I want to know, am I the only one in the building tonight that still believes in worship? I dare you to get on your feet and worship him right now. Get on your feet and praise him right now. Oh yeah. 
We believe in worship. I might as well tell this congregation. I know a little something, something about your church. I know a little bit about your church and your church. So let me just tell this congregation. When I consider both the blessings and calamities you've come through, I'm of the opinion there is no excuse for anybody not to worship God. I've never seen a body so tired that God didn't deserve praise. I've never seen a disability so bad that God wasn't worthy. I've never seen a trial so severe that God didn't deserve a response. I've never seen pain so deep that worship couldn't bring you out. I've never seen a wounded spirit so vexed that praise wouldn't bring you the victory there is no excuse there's no excuse not to worship God an idea I preached 306 times last year this is my 15th or 16th week out they've tried for two years to get me to get knee replacements because I'm bone on bone and the pain is unrelenting but I've got news for you I'm not gonna stop for nothing I come in every service and still worship I come in every environment and still praise him it ain't about my pain it's about his worthiness it ain't about my discouragement it's about his deserving shout shout And you might as well know that really worshiping God means sometimes you got to go beyond a single amen every third sermon. Sometimes really worshiping God means you got to go beyond clapping your hands twice whether God deserves it or not. Sometimes you got to go beyond standing up once in every service and that's to read the Bible. Our church is growing to the place. Sit down, Sarah. Our church is growing. We, we've just about doubled in the last couple of years. And we, we, we've got to where... We, we have to utilize chairs like that every now and then. And, and we used to have to use chairs all the time. Didn't have the pews we got now. And, and, and we, we got new people coming in. And, and it's, it's kind of funny. They, we move chairs often, but that's not a problem for some of my saints. They just find the one that's molded to the perfect shape of their backside. And they sit down right there because that's their pew. They sat down 37 years ago and ain't never stood back up since. And if they have to get another one, they just find one as far away from the altar as they can go. Every now and then you got to get something inside of you that says, I got to worship. You got to do more than lift one hand and say hallelujah under your breath to make it look like you're praying. 
if you're a worshiper there's coming a time you gotta get carried away and forget who's sitting around you forget the visitors on the back row and you gotta get a spirit that says get out of my way I'm gonna dance whether you like it or not forget everything else I'm gonna run these aisles because God deserves it I don't care if you worship or not I can worship by myself don't get me wrong tonight I'm not preaching against shouting or worshiping God you need to worship God but your worship alone won't keep you if you're dancing on altars you didn't build can I preach about Moses and Korah a little bit here right now I think I, think I got a little something, something I can tell you here you see we know there was a conflict that arose between Moses and Korah. Stay with me. But sometimes we don't see why that conflict arose between Moses and Korah. The Bible lets us know that Korah didn't believe in spiritual submission to a pastor. He felt like he ought to be able to be his own man of God. But Moses didn't, watch, watch. Moses didn't have that problem. Moses submitted himself to a man named Jethro. Uh, Moses had already built that altar of submission. But watch what happened. The Bible tells us it all came to a conclusion when Moses stood in the door of the temple and Korah and his followers stood out before him. Look at what the Bible Bible says, the Bible said that Korah and those 250 men with him, all of them had censers in their hands. Censers. They'd burn incense. It was a type of worship. Woo! 250 people all worshiping at the same time. Korah and 250 of the people he had influenced all worshiping at the same time. Sure, they were all worshiping, but suddenly the Bible tells us that the ground, the foundation began to crumble beneath them. And before it was over, the earth swallowed up Korah and 250 of his followers. Are you listening? to me right now look at how God described it the Bible said that God slew 250 men that offered incense God said they may have been worshiping but I judged them anyway and when it spoke about their deaths the Bible quickly tells why God judged them when he called them the censors of these sinners. Oh, they were dancing, but they were sinners. They were shouting, but they had to shout on somebody else's altar because they didn't ever built one of their own. Oh, they were running the aisles, but they were following somebody else because they'd never built an altar of their own. God said, look at the censors of these sinners. In no uncertain term, God said they're worshipers, but they were destined for failure because they were dancing on altars they didn't build. Let me tell you what you're going to start seeing. Not far from here, I just encountered the strongest charismatic compromising spirit that I've ever dealt with anywhere outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I know enough about devils. It's bound to bleed over into this area. But I want you to listen to this preacher right now. Even the religious world is starting to see their compromise crumbling beneath their feet because they've learned how to dance on altars they didn't build. Oh yeah, they learned a lot by watching churches just like this one just like the one in Ilsley just like the one in Madisonville just like the one in Marion they learned a lot by studying our precious preachers
Pentecostal ways but they ultimately can't stand because they've never built an altar of truth themselves that will hold them firm. Let me tell you why I'm seeing charismatic movements folding up everywhere. They have the shout, but they don't have an altar of separation. They have the dance, but they don't have an altar of doctrine. They have the praise, but they don't have an altar of passion. They have the hallelujah, but they don't have an altar of holiness. And the ground they're trying to dance on is crumbling because you don't dance on altars you didn't build ladies and gentlemen don't dance on altars you didn't build child of God let me say it once and for all we'll say brother what they're dancing they're shouting they gotta be wanting something from God yeah as long as it don't cost them nothing as long as that price tag ain't there They'll do anything as long as they don't have to pay that kind of price. But I'm telling you, if you're going to build an altar, it's going to cost you something. If you're going to build an altar, you ain't going to fit in every crowd. If you're going to build an altar, everybody's not going to like you. If you're going to build an altar, somebody's going to find fault with you. Watch. Watch. Brother White, they're dancing and they love God. And if they're dancing and love God, I guess they probably are going to go to heaven anyway. I'm going to tell you right now, everything that dances ain't sanctified. Seems to me like I heard about a girl named Herodias that decided to dance in front of a pagan king. She wanted something spiritual. She wanted the head of John the Baptist cut off and brought to her on a silver charger. I'm sorry, you can't have what you want if all you've got's a dance without an altar. Hey, she did it because she was destroying something. I'm not talking about destroying anything. I'm talking about building the this kingdom, building a church in this city. We've got to have revival. No, 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 I say it once and for all. There's nothing wrong with worship. In fact, everything is right with worship. But you need to know it's not enough to dance on altars you didn't build. It's not enough to sit there motionless and only join in when somebody else builds an altar of worship. It's not enough to sit there stoic and unconcerned and only get involved when somebody builds an altar of intensity. It's not enough to stand in this house, eat up with indifference until somebody builds an altar of travail that drags you to an altar. Is it any wonder your world's falling apart? Is it any wonder the foundation's crumbling beneath you? You're dancing on an altar you didn't build. So listen, listen, listen. Somewhere. Somewhere. At some time. All of us are going to need it. Every one of us, brother Daniel Lord. Every one of us are going to need it. Understand, you're going to need God to move in your world. And to get that kind of move of God, you need to be dancing on an altar you've designed and built to carry the weight of your problems. You need an altar that's strong enough to hold up under the pressure you're going to carry there with your praise. Someday, you're going to need what comes only with an altar of your own. I'd remind you that in spite of all of their dancing on Elijah's altar, there wasn't one hint of fire that fell from heaven as a result of their praise. I don't don't, don't mean to offend anybody in here, but can, can I just act like I'm home right now? 
I'm always very diplomatic at home because I'm scared of losing tithe payers, I guess. But if you ain't living right, shut up and sit down. You ain't got no business dancing around the front of the church wanting to be seen by somebody. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. If you haven't built an altar, your shout means nothing. If you haven't built an altar, your dance means nothing. If you haven't built an altar, your praise means nothing. Just a few weeks ago, we was in the middle of church preaching. Ooh. I mean, I was gut preaching. It was one of them nights. Brother Henry felt like everything was hitting on all eight cylinders. Or at my size, 10 cylinders and maybe 12 cylinders with my size. I don't know. Everything was hitting on all cylinders. And all of a sudden, I see my phone start flashing. They know better than call me in the middle of preaching. Dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. I looked down. It wasn't a call. It was a text. What you guys don't know is my hearing aids connect to my telephone. I silence my phone so y'all don't hear it ring. But it still comes in my ears. God forbid I make a blooper because both my sons, Nathaniel and Benjamin, are in a text room with Scott Graham and me. And if I make a blooper, all I hear for the next 10 minutes is do 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 Finally, I look down, see this text is from my wife. She said, there's an elder, told me the elder's name, and said, family just called and said, it looks like death's going to take him. He's at the point of death. He, he's got what they were calling death rattles. They, he, he was sucking air, breathing like four times a minute. And he's trying to survive. And within moments, we begin to, we stopped the service when I read it. I couldn't get away from it. I didn't care how much I was in the middle of preaching. Nothing mattered more than that person. So we stopped everything in our service. And when we stopped everything in our service, we begin to pray. And when we prayed, the fire of God fell. And we answered our prayers. And not only did he live, but he got out of the hospital and was a glorious miracle. But let me ask you a question. What happens when you need the fire of God to fall and you don't have a corporate altar and you don't have an altar your pastor built and you don't have the altar the leaders built? What do you do then? What do you do when you need the fire of God to fall? But there's not an altar that you've built that can carry you. I feel the Holy Ghost beginning to set down. Trust me, there's coming a day when you are going to need the power of God in your world. The church ain't going to be there with you. The congregations, you know what it's like, son. You just went through it yourself. You wasn't expecting it, son, but it was there. What you going to do when the congregation's prayers aren't there to help you? When the strength of your altar won't be enough to beckon the fires of God? What will you do then? There's coming a day. Some of you are going to need to lay hands on a dying soul and see the fire of God fall. Some of you are going to need to cast out that demonic spirit from that home and see the fire of God fall. Some of you are going to have to pray the prayer for that desperate need and see the fire of God intervene. But it's not going to happen just because you know how to dance. Just because you know all the words to the song. It's not going to happen just because you can move to the beat of the music. You've got to quit dancing on altars you didn't build and build an altar of your own. Build an altar of commitment. An altar of righteousness. An altar of faithfulness. (laughs) 
uniquely it's a common theme throughout the entirety of the word of God. For instance, let me give you one. They took handkerchiefs from the body of Paul and people were healed that weren't even in the building where Paul had wiped his old bald head to get the sweat off with a handkerchief. They, they weren't even there. The Bible said they were healed because the fire knew how to fall in Paul's world. Paul had an altar of his own. He had an altar of dedication in his own life. But watch! Standing on the outskirts of the Apostle Paul was a man known as Simon the Sorcerer. He said, I got good money here, Paul. Here you go, Paul. Here's what I need, Paul. I need you to give me that ability. Give me that. Give, give me a hanky so I can heal people. Give me a hanky so I can lay hands on people. Only to hear Paul tell him, your money perish with you. I am convinced, Brother Michael Orton, Pastor, I am convinced that Simon the Sorcerer goes to some of our churches because they come to our place and we've got an abundance of people that want the power of God and they're willing to do just about anything but dedicate themselves to have it. You want me to perform? I'll perform. You, you, you want me to dance? I'll dance. You want me to march? I'll march. Just don't ask me to dedicate myself. But real altars are only built out of dedication. Real altars are only built out of faithfulness. The Holy Ghost is sitting down right now. Lift your hands up and begin to pray. I am convinced, buddy. I'm convinced, buddy, that the fires of God are never going to fall in anybody's hands if those hands haven't been busy building altars to support their worship. Altars that can support their dancing. I got to quit. Forgive me, I've gone 46 minutes. It's coming. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe a, maybe a few weeks from now, and you'll probably be home by yourself, and then it's going to happen. Something is going to scream into your world that can only be fixed by the fire falling. But when that time comes, I want to know if you'll be dancing on altars of commitment that you built. Or are you just going to try to dance on altars you didn't build? My message is simple. You don't dance on altars you didn't build. I find it interesting that when Elijah told the prophets of Baal, my brother, why be ye halt between two opinions? That word halt was the very same word as the word leaped, and it meant to dance. So God was saying, why do you keep dancing between two opinions? You dancing for God one minute. You dancing with the devil the next. Why are you dancing between two opinions? 
You said it right to start this service tonight. If we're going to get it, it's going to cost us everything. There's coming a day, darling, it's going to cost us our comfort. Hey, this world's not done yet. There's other pandemics that are going to come. There are things that are going to come upon this. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't believe we're going through the great tribulation. But I do believe that we're going to go through a lot more tribulation than we're seeing right now. And when it comes, you're going to have to make up your mind. Am I more interested in my comfort or in Jesus? Am I more interested in my good home or Jesus? Am I more interested in my good job or Jesus? Stand to your feet with me right now. Gifts of the Spirit are very close to us now. Conviction is in this place. Somebody in here, I love your worship. Pastor, I love your worship. When I come here, your worship team. Oh, I always get my old legs doing that stuff. And I, I love the way y'all preach with me. I love the way you folks love me. I want you to know how much I love and appreciate you. But hear me and hear me well. None of it matters if you're just dancing on somebody else's altar. God is calling this church tonight. God is calling every individual from every congregation represented. God's calling every one of you tonight to start building an altar that will support everything you want in God. But you're going to have to build your own altar. You can't dance on altars you didn't build. I, I don't know if music needs to come. I, don't, I just feel like somebody needs to pray today. Why don't we all just find a place to touch heaven? Thanks for taking the time to take in today's program. This is a media ministry outreach of Truth Apostolic Church in Madisonville, Kentucky. For more information about our ministry, visit our website.